Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Patty Ferguson Bonney, and I'm Puana Shan from Louisiana. I teach at the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law, and I'm co-chair of the Native American Concerns Committee for the ABA section of Civil Rights and Social Justice. We are so excited to be presenting a timely panel entitled Obstacles at Every Turn, Native Vote in a World of Coronavirus. This is sponsored by the ABA section of Civil Rights and Social Justice. And this panel is one of a many, of many in a series of rapid response webinars. We're actively planning additional programming on a variety of issues. So please visit AmericanBar.org forward slash CRSI for updates on these programs. During today's program, we encourage you to ask questions of our panelists through the Q&A, not the chat function. If you do not see the controls, please ensure your screen is not idle. We will address questions at the end of the panel. We will be sharing a recording of this program to everyone who has registered so that you can share it widely with your networks. And with that, we are happy to begin today's program entitled Obstacles at Every Turn, Native Vote in a World of Coronavirus. I wanna note that this presentation focuses on a report issued by the Native American Rights Fund titled Obstacles at Every Turn, Barriers to Political Participation Faced by Native American Voters. The report documents that Native people face obstacles at every turn in the electoral process, from registering to vote, to casting votes, to having votes counted. After the report findings are shared, we will discuss how the Native vote is impacted by coronavirus and what can be done to ensure the right to vote for Native voters on election day. Next slide. We're honored to have today with us two experts on election law. Our first panelist is Jacqueline DeLeon. She's a sled of Pueblo and a staff attorney for the Native American Rights Fund. She actively litigates voting cases on behalf of tribes and has testified before Congress on multiple occasions regarding voting rights issues in Indian country. We also have with us James Tucker, who's of counsel at Wilson Elser and serves as pro bono counsel to NARF. Jim has successfully litigated voting rights cases on behalf of tribal citizens. He also serves on the National Advisory Committee for the Census. Jim and Jacqueline led the field hearings that serve as the basis of the report and co-authored the report with Dan McCool. Next slide. Um, the Native American Voting Rights Coalition was formed in 2015 under the leadership of the Native American Rights Fund and it includes national and regional organizations, academics, attorneys and tribes advocating for equal access to voting for Native Americans. The purpose of this coalition was to facilitate collaboration and coordination in addressing the barriers faced by Native voters. Coalition members, as you see on the screen, assisted in the field organizing and preparing for the field hearings. Next slide. So why was it so important to have the field hearings that serve the basis of this report? Well, first, it's important to note that the Supreme Court struck down Section 4, pre, the Section 4 preclearance formula under the notion that the Voting Rights Act did its job and that voting is now equally accessible to all voters. There's no more disparities in registration and turnout due to race. Those of us working in Indian country know that that's not true and that Native Americans continue to face actual barriers to voting that are preventing them from exercising the right to vote and stripping them of their political power. So the purpose of the field hearings was to really understand and identify the barriers to both registration and voting. It would, and so the, the purpose of the field hearings then were threefold to help in the development of and the response to public policy to assist in the pursuit of legal remedies to expand Native American voter participation and to promote public education on voting rights in Indian country. Next slide. So as you can see, there were a number of field hearings across the United States and Indian country from 2017 and 2018. So these public hearings were held across Indian country so we can understand how native people are systematically and culturally kept from fully exercising their franchise. 
more than 120 witnesses testified from dozens of tribes from across the country. Again, we're so honored to have with us Jacqueline and James, who can share with us the findings from these field hearings. So at this time, I wanna turn my time over to the panelists so that they can share the findings. Thanks so much, Patty. Um, so as we get started, one of the things I just wanna mention before we go through this is that typically voting rights are viewed through the lens of three different types of claims, what are called first generation claims, second generation claims, and third generation claims. First generation claims and barriers are the most basic barriers to participation. They're barriers to registering to vote, to casting a ballot, and to having a ballot counted. Uh, what you're gonna see today is most of what we're talking about will be first generation barriers. Second generation barriers are those that basically replicate some of the barriers that voters experience, except they move it to, the, to election results. And typically you see it most commonly in the form of redistricting, where you know, even if native voters in some cases may be a majority in a jurisdiction, they're never able to elect or have an equal opportunity to elect the candidate of their choice because the lines are drawn in a way to prevent them from doing that. Um, there, there'll be some discussion of that at the end because, um, because we do have some redistricting issues that we'll, we'll talk about. Um, and then the final uh, area is the third generation barriers, and that's where you end up having the disenfranchisement replicated in the legislature. And typically those are not protected by the courts except through what you will, will oftentimes see in the form of an equal protection challenge. Um, we are gonna talk about as we go through this, some of the issues where there are um, disparate treatment of Native Americans in substantive representation. Um, again, a third generation sort of barrier, largely because you, see, you will see uh, the first two barriers. So just as an overview of what we'll be covering, um, initially we're gonna do this in different parts, but these are issues that come up in terms of every aspect of Native voting. Um, so we're gonna start with isolating conditions. And one of the most basic ones is geography. The reservations by design is part of what happened in the 19th century um, were, were meant to separate Native Americans, in some cases, not only from their ancestral lands, but oftentimes through populated areas where non-Natives lived. And the net effect of that is that you end up having Native Americans living in some of the most isolated regions of the United States. You can see that one third of all American Indians and Alaska Natives live in what are called hard to count census tracts. And by the way, that includes not only those living on reservations, but even those who live in urban areas oftentimes are in the hardest to count communities. This just highlights how many, like what percentage by state, the top three have Native Americans living in hard to count tracks. And you can see New Mexico uh, leads the pack, uh, largely because of the Navajo Nation and the tribes and pueblos there. Uh, Arizona is closely behind, followed by Alaska with um, the remote areas of Alaska. And then you can see some examples. Um, you know, Havasupai is a particularly stark example because the reservation is at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. Now, Alaska, this is one of the areas that the Native American Rights Fund has pursued a decade or more worth of litigation. The Bethel Census area was the first area that we brought a language case in. And you can see just how large that is and how few people are there. It's the size of the state of Tennessee but there were less than 18,000 people who lived there. And of those, we had a population of over 15,000 Yupik speaking Alaska natives. So it's a very large population in terms of the percentage, but not in terms of numbers. Um, other isolating conditions you'll see will be things like bad roads, mountains, waters, and canyons. You can see the picture there from the Navajo Nation. Uh, the mud is so bad, the bus is stuck, and you can actually see they're trying to pull the bus out. This just highlights Nye County, Nevada. You can see the star up in the up, upper right-hand corner. That's the Duckwater Reservation. And you can see the mountain ranges there run north to south, which oftentimes translates into where as the crow flies, a polling place or an elections office may only be 20 or 30 miles away as the crow flies. But if you're gonna take a road to go around all of the mountain ranges, again, that can actually take several hours. And you can see in Nye County, it would be over five hours to get to the closest election office in Tonopah and over 10 hours to get to Pahrump, which is the county seat. So in terms of linguistic barriers, this is something we'll talk about a little bit more. 
but much of Indian country, and again, you can see uh, all of Alaska and then most of the Southwest is covered under the language assistance provisions of the Voting Rights Act, which means that you have um, especially a lot of tribal elders who are limited English proficient and cannot vote without getting assistance in their native language. This just highlights where the languages are and what they are and where they're located. Uh, and again, you can see Navajo is the most prevalent. Um, Choctaw, people don't oftentimes think of Mississippi, but um, 10 counties in Mississippi are co covered for the Choctaw language. And then Alaska is covered for a whole series of different languages. And again, so, in some cases, they can be very few people who speak them, but again, there's a very high need for assistance. This just puts it in stark numbers. You'll see 54,000 in Alaska, over 54,000, um, almost 125,000 in Arizona, and over 130,000 in New Mexico. Um, nationwide, there are about 340,000 limited English proficient native speakers who live on areas covered by Section 203. Um, technology, we'll, we'll talk about this a lot more, is a big problem. Wi-Fi is not readily available, and it's oftentimes very expensive. Um, there's a generational divide. You'll oftentimes find that the youth use um, cell phones just as much as non-native youth do, but tribal elders may not be able to use it at all. This just shows you graphically the areas where there is very limited broadband access, and in particular, the areas that are the lighter color. Um, you can see pretty much all of remote Alaska falls into that category. And then for the western half of the United States, most of the, those areas that lack broadband coverage are the reservations. And then, of course, educational isolation has been a big problem. Uh, one of the things we found, for example, in Alaska is that most of the Alaska Native villages did not even have high schools until the mid-1980s. Um, Alaska apparently did not get the memo about Bronvo's Board of Education or just simply ignored it. And the net effect of that is that it's very common in most of the villages there that people who are over the age of 45 will have a you know, very limited education of maybe a first or fifth grade um, education level. And because the voting materials are generally written at a 12th grade level or higher, you know, basically at least a high school equivalency or higher, they simply can't read and participate without getting assistance. And again, this just shows you some of the numbers. Uh, for Navajo, for example, you can see illiteracy is basically about a quarter. Uh, for Apache, it's just under 7%. For Choctaw, it's about a third of all of those who are limited English proficient. Uh, and then of course you see the numbers from New Mexico. Poverty is also a big problem, and that's especially going to come into play when we talk about distance issues. Um, you can see the median household income. That obviously affects who will have access to vehicles. And then I think, um, Jacqueline, this is where I'm turning it over to you. Thanks, Jim, um, and thank you for having me, and, and Patty and, and Jim, it's always so wonderful to do panels with you, my esteemed colleagues, uh, and so precious to me, um, you know, while we do this work. Um, so actually, if we could go back to the previous slide real quick. So the poverty rates, I think, are important to pause on, and the reason uh, that we do is because Obviously, as we talk about the costs that come with voting and registration, poverty is going to inform all of those costs, right? So I think the basic principle is that, um, you know, the higher the cost, the less likely somebody is going to um, pay the cost to vote, right? So uh, in the case of Native American communities, um, we're going to see just exactly how unreasonably high um, those costs are compounded by the fact that there's a already a very high poverty rate. Um, so nationally, the uh, Native American poverty rate is 26.6%. And then on tribal lands, it's an astounding 38.3%, uh, meaning that most, uh, you know, that there are many, many people uh, living in abject poverty and, and others that are, are, are also quite poor. Next slide. So Lack of resources and funding, the tribal governments themselves are under uh, often under resourced. And then we also see that the county and the state and local governments are not stepping in 
to uh, fulfill their obligations and also provide funding. Um, often what we hear is an under, a misunderstanding of what county uh, obligations are towards Native Americans. Sometimes that can go back to a misunderstanding generally of uh, the county's relationship with the tribe, right? So the tribe can exercise sovereignty in a lot of areas. Um, and so the tribe is unfamiliar, you know, try to keep a hands-off approach towards tribes. But then when it's time for them to fulfill their obligations, fulfill their obligations to tribal citizens who are also county citizens when it comes to voting, they don't actually allocate the funding uh, on Native American lands and Native Americans end up losing out. Um, we also see uh, just blatantly discriminatory practices, for example, in Alaska, um, where they hired dozens of Alaska Native vill um, you know, villagers, but then only paid them a per diem instead of the hourly wage that they paid the rest of the state poll workers. And so the Native Americans ended up earning something like 12 cents an hour instead of the you know, nearly $12 an hour that the rest of the uh, state poll workers were uh, earning. Next slide. There's also, uh, I think broadly, the residential features of uh, Indian country end up having a huge impact on the ability uh, for Native Americans to register and cast their, their, their votes. Because um, I think the simple way of thinking about it is realizing that in rural Native America, lots and lots of people don't have sufficient housing because there aren't enough housing use, units. So there's this compounding injustice that occurs that because there's a scarcity of housing, uh, people end up having to um, share homes. And uh, it, throughout the field hearings, it was not uncommon to hear of 10 to 15 people sharing a home. Um, you know, we saw heard uh, evidence of as high as 48 people on average sharing a home, which is obviously just um, crazy. Uh, but the, you know, according, there's, there's uh, consequently, given that this lack of housing units and the, the, the um, poverty of the company poverty, uh, there is just a very low percentage of home ownership, um, which means that all of the um, uh, documentation, uh, proof of addressing that comes with having an address uh, are difficult to obtain. Next slide. But I think what's most striking about, you know, not just the lack of home ownership and not just the lack of um, having a stable house, and, you know, just having that need to go from home to home is that those homes that are on the reservation may just not have an address at all, which means that there is a lack of um, addressing. People say, well, what about then the 911 services? How are they going to get there? That's exactly sort of the type of inequities that plague uh, Indian country. So somebody will call uh, because of an emergency and have to give a physical description of where to find the home. Um, and that means that uh, because they do not have an address such as 123 Main Street, um, that means that uh, they aren't gonna receive mail at their home. We're gonna dive into that a little later, but that just means that, that there isn't gonna be that safe option of receiving a ballot at the home and it's not gonna be uh, simple to register. Next slide. And here is, um, you know, much like the uh, map about uh, technolo uh, technology deficits, it looks very similar to this map, which is the non-traditional mailing addresses, uh, the lack of, um, of uh, address that's, that, that is 123 Main Street. Um, and those maps look remarkably the same because they are rem unremarkably Indian country. Next slide. And so uh, another thing that we saw time and time again was just the absolute um, horrendous conditions, the road conditions uh, in Indian country. And so what this little video is showing um, was when I was in North Dakota and we were litigating the voter ID case, um, there we, we decided to take a side trip and look on the Turtle Mountain Reservation to see uh, the conditions of some of the roads on election day. Uh, so this here is a road on the Turtle Mountain Reservation on election day that is unmarked and nearly impassable. Next slide. So um, you know, we briefly talked about these series of difficulties, uh, overarching difficulties uh, in you know, registering and casting our ballot. But what ends up happening is that what those barriers are communicating 
is that they are going to be compounded on top of a, a long legacy of discrimination towards Na Native Americans. And so those two things mean that Native Americans uh, largely distrust um, tribal and state governments. And in 2016, um, NARF and the Native American Voting Rights uh, Coalition conducted a series of surveys. And what we found um, after surveying 28 uh, Native, 2,800 Native voters in Arizona, Nevada, New Mexico, and South Dakota is that tribal governments by far were the most trusted. Um, and uh, state and local, uh, state and federal governments were less trusted. Um, in South Dakota, just 16.3% of Native Americans trusted the state government. Um, and obviously uh, these tensions between Native Americans and state governments are compounded um, uh, when there are uh, issues such as Bears Ears, the Dakota Access Pipeline, Keystone XL Pipeline. Next slide. And so um, with this long legacy of uh, discrimination, um, and with the difficulties uh, casting a ballot, I think what we see resonating in Native communities is this idea that the American system is not for Native Americans, right? If, you, if, it's, if it's clear to you that the system where you're supposed to cast your ballot has not been conceived with you in mind, then I think that it's not surprising that in turn, Native Americans don't feel a part of uh, the American system. And so uh, Native Americans instead say, okay, I'm gonna withdraw from that system and only participate in my tribal government. It's not that Native Americans aren't civic minded. We see quite high civic engagement um, of Native Americans within their own tribal governments. Next slide. And uh, you know what these kind of, um, and we'll talk a little later about the overt racism that Native Americans face, but what these type of uh, traumatic uh, experiences, these difficulties and what these barriers do to Native Americans is they leave a lasting impression, even an intergenerational impression because elders uh, will tell Native American, you know, the younger people don't participate in that system. And that's because they've been told things like, you have to renounce your citizenship in order to cast a vote. In North Dakota, for example, uh, the constitution required that a person be civilized in order to vote, which required Native Americans to renounce tribal citizenship in order to vote, which meant that elders then told their children that you know, voting in the American system is, is, is um, antithetical to sovereignty. And so, if somebody has a bad experience voting, uh, it will have a lasting impact. Next slide. And I think I turn it back to Jim. Thanks so much, Jacqueline. And so this just again gives you an additional overview of other things that we're gonna dig down a little bit more into, um, language assistance, voter registration barriers, and then of course, barriers to casting a ballot and electing candidates of choice. So in terms of language assistance, this is actually one of the things that we're going to talk about a little bit more when we get to the COVID portion, uh, because we have such a large percentage of the native voting population that is limited English proficient that needs to get assistance in their native tongue. And as a result, it's critical to make sure not just that they have a place to go and a person to get it from on election day, but more importantly, or equally important, they have to be able to get some of that information before election day. One of the big problems that we've consistently noticed throughout Indian country is that there's a lack of pre-election outreach and publicity. So, uh, especially in the Western states where it's commonplace to have ballot measures that oftentimes are very complex that, you know, for all of those on this call, you may be a lawyer, but they may be written in double or triple negatives. It's difficult for us to understand in English. It is completely incomprehensible to those who are limited English proficient. It would be like if you tried to, to vote in a foreign language that you didn't speak, and that's what uh, especially the elders will encounter. And for that reason, it's really important that there be outreach that's culturally appropriate, but also linguistically um, appropriate for Indian country to make sure that those messages get out. People also have to know about what are the deadlines for registering to vote. Where do they go to register to vote? How do they write request in some in some places an absentee ballot? What's the process for doing that? Can they get someone to help them to complete the form that's written all in English? They may not be able to read or write in any language. And so that reason, again, it's very, very important. And where that's not done, it's effectively denying any opportunity to participate. And not only that, the other thing that we've consistently found is that even where you have someone who 
can speak and read English, oftentimes by not providing the assistance in their native language, it tells them that their own culture doesn't matter, that they're not valued as a voter. And that's something that really, um, that really does need to be part of the equation as well. Obviously, um, some of the things that Jacqueline just talked about in terms of non-traditional mailing addresses come into play when you try to register to vote. If you don't have a home, um, or your, your home may be that you're shifting couches, um, what's called couch surfing, you know, between relatives or family and friends, uh, and you don't really have a place that you, you regularly get your mail, that makes it very difficult when you try to register to vote. The other thing that we've done in terms of the inset that you see that's blown up here, this is something that's required by the National Voter Registration Act because where you have no address, and you can see, you may not be able to read it, but I will read it for you, the instructions say in the inset, if no street address, draw a map here, and then it gives a compass. The purpose of that is, um, and it, when, when you get, when you're registering to vote, the reason why people need to know, election administrators need to know your address it's not just to get you the mail, but they have to understand which precinct that they need to put you in for purposes of voting. And that's what this is meant to address. And this is what is um, permitted and actually required by the National Voter Registration Act, that if you have a non-traditional address, draw a map and give instructions on where people can find you. And the elections office has to accommodate that. The problem is far too often they do not. Um, Voter ID laws have also inhibited the ability of people to register to vote because, again, if you have a non-traditional address or an address, a form of address that state or local law does not um, accept, then it places you in an impossible position that you want to participate, but you can't. And your only recourse may be voting by provisional ballot on election day, only to have that ballot in all likelihood disallowed because... Uh, again, there's no verified address that matches up with that. But again, just to go back to the previous slide, that's, again, specifically why there already is a, a solution under federal law that uh, federal law requires that they accept your address, whatever it may be. Uh, far too often that doesn't happen. So in terms of um, socioeconomic barriers, we're going to talk about something that we call the tyranny of distance. And this is going to come up repeatedly. The tyranny of distance is if you have to drive what may seem like a short distance to you or I because we have a vehicle, it could be 20 or 30 or 40 miles, the tyranny is if you don't have access to a car, if the roads are impassable um, because of weather conditions, um, the fact that you have to pay gas to travel that far, you may have a job or two jobs or three jobs and you don't have time to drive that distance. And then, of course, other remedies that may be available to those outside of Indian country in the form of registration online may not be available to you because you lack Wi-Fi and you can't afford it. So, again, this just really kind of overlaps. You're going to hear a lot of what we will say will overlap, and a lot of this will also come into play when we talk about COVID and, and op options for doing things other than in-person voting. And, again, you can see... The, the problem here is going to be, um, you know, voter registration forms oftentimes need to be physically delivered to someone and completed and returned. Um, we are, we're finding repeatedly, and there was a lot of testimony about limitations on the number of voter registration forms that can be picked up um, and the number that elections offices in some cases would even accept. Uh, you have to drive those back. It takes time. It takes money. It takes gas. Um, and, you know, uh, again, and Jacqueline will be talking about this a little bit later, when you have restrictions placed on people on their ability to collect voting materials um, for other people who may live um, in their area, um, that, uh, that also inhibits the ability to participate. Something else that we're consistently finding is that there's unequal funding that's specifically directed at voter registration efforts on tribal lands. Um, it, it compounds the problems that we see where um, elections offices are reluctant to give re voter registration forms in a form um, and, and the number that, that would allow people in a community on the reservation to register. And then, of course, you have that compounded when there are efforts to try to have satellite offices, um, which make a lot of sense to put those in some of the tribal administration offices to make them readily available. And, of course, that doesn't happen. And I believe something else Jacqueline may mention, and I'm going to nudge her on this, is um, this is an issue that comes up 
um, in terms of what, you know, one of the things that NARV is currently working on in South Dakota, and I'll let her talk a little bit about NVRA in just a moment. Uh, and so this is what you see. What you, the quote from Erica Shelby is the problem that we consistently see, that there are limitations being placed on the number of voter registration cards that can be returned, uh, or they may not be counted, or there are concerns, are they just going to throw this in the trash? And even after someone fills out a voter registration card, they never receive any mail from the elections office only to find out that their form was never processed. Felon disenfranchisement affects many minority communities and, and people of color, but it has a, an especially detrimental impact in Indian country. You can again see that um, in some cases, you know, it varies a lot from state to state. The worst of the worst in terms of felon disenfranchisement laws are the ones where after someone has already served out the terms and conditions of the release, they've served their sentence, they've served their probation and parole, and they still can't register to vote until they go through a formal process to be readmitted. And far too often we're seeing that that process is manipulated either because they don't process the forms quickly enough, they don't have enough staff, um, or they just simply ignore it or deny requests because the concern, again, is about manipulating the electorate uh, for, you know, who will actually be able to vote. Non-traditional addresses um, oftentimes result in purges. The big example that we have is, that came up is from Apache County. This was now eight years ago. But going back to that form where I had the inset, um, voters had completed that to show where they live, um, only to find out that the county recorder claimed that their addresses were too obscure and said that they couldn't determine where they were supposed to be placed in which precinct. And so they simply purged them, oftentimes without any notice at all. And again, the other issue we see consistently with voter purges, um, what are you know, kind of you know, euphemistically referred to as um, you know, basically administrative efforts to clean up the voter registration rolls, um, that those notices and information are not provided in the Indian country and oftentimes not in the native language. And then uh, my last slide before I turn it over to Jacqueline is um, again, the other thing that we will see, and this is gonna be a big issue of concern for COVID as well, is the rejection of forms for technicalities, um, where you have, you know, maybe there is someone who is supposed to witness it. Um, oftentimes that comes up, they, you know, they will object to the form of ID, or they will say that they don't like the fact that um, you'll have an individual who has no expertise saying that there's no signature um, that matches, uh, at least according to their eye, and they don't follow up with the voter to basically deny the voter an opportunity to correct it and be able to register the vote. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Jacqueline. So now we're going to shift um, from registration to barriers to actually casting the ballot. Uh, and one of the big things is just the lack of uh, on reservation polling places, right? So as Jim mentioned earlier, the geographic distance means that uh, often we'll see a polling place in an like whatever is the closest border town. Uh, that doesn't mean it's close. It could be 20, 40 miles away. Um, and what we hear uh, uh, quite often is that the reason that Native Americans are being denied an on-reservation polling place is not any type of animus, but because you know the state might have a rule that requires uh, a certain number of registered voters, these threshold requirements, uh, before um, they can put a polling place in uh, a location. Now this ends up being really problematic uh, on Indian lands because really what we get is this vicious cycle, right? Because of all of the barriers to registration that we uh, heard Jim just go over, um, there's not enough registered voters to meet that threshold requirement, even if there are far enough, uh, you know, there's plenty of eligible um, Native American uh, prospective voters, right? Um, and so they'll say, uh, you know, you don't have 200 registered voters, um, and so we can't put a polling place there. So tribes have to engage uh, in a, you know, really aggressive voter registration efforts just to try and meet that threshold requirement. But if there was a polling place, then we think that the, the enthusiasm would be much higher, the ability for people to register and participate in voting would be higher. Uh, so what we end up getting is really just this vicious cycle. Next slide. Um, additionally, like we, I said before, um, is that there is really a lack of um, consistent uh, or equitable funding. Um, you know, there's a, a misunderstanding, I think, that 
Native Americans uh, as American and county citizens are entitled to having their vote cast. Sometimes that might mean spending money on them, right? Um, and they're entitled to that spending because uh, they are entitled to have a, a, a voice in the election system. Um, and what we hear instead is, uh, is a lot of county officials saying, well, that would be too expensive. Um, but really the purpose of the office, right, is to provide uh, voting opportunities. And so they're really, you know, the cost that it takes uh, to provide Native Americans um, equitable access uh, shouldn't be a barrier, but often um, we just see a lack of enthusiasm for funding activities on Native American lands altogether. Next slide. Um, so really what we get is a big void uh, on reservations. Um, the counties aren't doing, uh, aren't reaching out or aren't providing uh, um, services, uh, and aren't providing an on-reservation polling place. But also the candidates and the political parties uh, also are not spending those types of resources um, on Indian lands. Um, time and time again, we conducted a, again, we conducted a survey and uh, the majority, vast majority of Native Americans living on reservations had never seen a voter registration drive. Um, they were unfamiliar with the candidates who had never visited the re reservation. Um, and there really wasn't, uh, there isn't the type of outreach that uh, you know, you would expect to see or that uh, people living that aren't living on a reservation are used to seeing. Next slide. Um, you know, again, as Jim mentioned, uh, it's impossible, difficult, if not impossible to cast a ballot if you don't understand it. Um, and we uh, saw time and time again that um, ballots and initiatives can be worded in confusing um, ways that have very high uh, readability scores, you know, meaning that they, you know, have to have over uh, a high school education uh, just to be understood. Um, and if this is your second language, if it's a second language uh, for Native Americans, or if there's been an inadequate education, then that makes it really difficult to fill out and cast that ballot. Next. And then, uh, you know, turning to uh, even more disturbing is what we see is um, the use of state actors like the police in order to intimidate voters uh, from being able to cast their ballot. Um, so these are quotes from people, uh, from uh, witnesses uh, that talked about how uh, Native American, the police presence was used to intimidate voters in their community. And in this instance, um, the polling location was actually inside of a sheriff's office, despite the fact that there was a uh, hostility uh, between the Native American community and law enforcement, serving as a huge deterrent uh, to actually casting a ballot. The picture we have here is from South Dakota. Uh, this uh, uh, police officer was just inside of the polling place. Uh, he it was, was um, had his hand on his gun uh, for most of the time that people came in to, to, to um, vote, you know, was just tapping his hands uh, on his gun, um, which, you know, obviously served to intimidate voters. And what we see is that uh, Native American, uh, th that, excuse me, that police officers will often just um, put their police cars on the road between the reservation and the border town uh, and they check the plates of everybody that goes by, um, which you know many Native Americans may have crimes of poverty, unpaid pick, uh, parking tickets, um, and a general distrust of the police, making this this practice especially harmful. Next slide. And this here is just an example from 2018 on, in North Dakota, where a community member was um, uh, letting people know of exactly that sort of instance, where um, she uh, observed police officers checking the plates of um, Native Americans uh, heading in to vote. Um, and so she offered uh, to drive people who she knew uh, may not have licenses or registrations on their car. Next slide. Next slide. Um, and uh, Native Americans also face hostility if they do make it to the polls. Um, so, uh, you know, there is um, a, a lot of uh, hostility, you know, so poll workers that can be intimidating. Um, but then let's switch to, to mail-in voting, which I think we're going to sort of um, try and emphasize later as well, because it's become a 
hot topic, especially in a time of COVID. Um, you know, there's been a push and there's this feeling like mail-in voting increases turnout. We cannot stress enough that that is not the case in Indian country, that casting a vote, vote by mail is difficult and sometimes impossible for Native American communities. Like we already talked about, um, Native Americans lack the traditional mailing address. They're not receiving mail at their homes. And so they aren't able to um, safely cast a ballot from home and instead have to go um, to a post office to pick up a ballot. Um, sometimes the registration forms are being rejected if they have a non-mailing um, address, if they don't have an accompanying residential physical address to go with the non um, with the uh, non-residential mailing address. A PO box alone is not sufficient. Um, and we have seen, in fact, counties use uh, that type of um, uh, lack of, of mail access in order to disenfranchise uh, communities. In San Juan County, Utah, uh, officials there switched to an all vote by mail system in part to disenfranchise the Native Americans and uh, knowing that they didn't have regular mail access. Uh, and that was um, uh, overturned and found to be unlawful. Next, next. Um, uh, there was settled after lengthy uh, litigation there. Um, so how do Native Americans get mail? Native Americans have to travel uh, to a post office that's usually off the reservation. Um, the post office itself is uh, a rural post office, and so it is open limited hours. We've seen post offices open from, for example, 11 to 3 o'clock during the week workday, um, uh, and then not open on the weekends or open one one was open from 830 to 945 on a Saturday a.m. Uh, not exactly the most uh, compre uh, most accessible post office that I've ever seen in my life. Um, you can imagine that if you're working, um, then it is all but impossible to make it to the post office. Uh, it would require you to travel a significant distance uh, in order to get to that post office. Then you'd have to make it in this uh, really narrow window of time. Um, and uh, we see that people often are sharing a PO box. So the PO box itself uh, will have 10 to 15 people. The person who registered for that post office box uh, will be the only one that, you know, there's only one person registered that post office box. But we see many people sharing a post office box because just like housing, um, they uh, have a limited number of post office boxes. Um, and because the burdens are so high to pick up and drop off the mail, right? It requires the gas, it requires the car, it requires the time uh, during the week, middle of the work week to pick up the mail. Um, and all of those are really high costs. People end up sharing a post office box so that they can help each other out, pick up and drop off mail for each other. Um, so that um, uh, not everybody has to bear the burden of those costs. And so, uh, you know, it's not uncommon for somebody to say, get the word out, hey, I'm doing a mail run, you know, drive around, pick up some post office keys, drive into the post office during these limited hours, pick up the mail for the community, come back and distribute it. Um, and that's just uh, because, um, uh, you know, of all of these really high burdens. Um, and then I'll also say that if you're gonna if you're gonna send out your mail from a rural post office box, uh, the delivery times of that mail is likely to be delayed, right? So um, and that's because uh, mail coming from uh, rural post offices often travels a very circuitous route, meaning it goes, um, for example, the Walker River Paiute Tribe. Uh, if you send out your mail, it will bump 90 miles down to Las uh, Vegas, or excuse me, to Reno, before it is bumped back up to the nearby city of Hawthorne where the county seat is, which is only and originally 40 miles away from the reservation, but it does this really long loop before it actually gets to the county seat, resulting in a lot of delays. Uh, next slide. Um, and uh, again, we saw that these, uh, just like registration, as Jen said, um, the absentee uh, and mail-in ballots are going to, uh, requests are going to be rejected for the same reasons, the lack of residential address and the difficulty um, uh, of administrators uh, to figure out where to mail the ballot. Um, uh, we also saw, I think, a disturbing instance of um, voter suppression in Wisconsin where uh, you know, a county official didn't 
mail out the ballots uh, to the entire tribal council that was leaving uh, for an out of town meeting. Um, when a tribal member was in an election, the, the county official had openly endorsed the other candidate. Um, and despite um, the council calling, asking for their ballots, uh, they never um, received them, left for the out of town meeting. One uh, tribal council member drove four hours just to cast their ballot. The other council members couldn't make that trip. And uh, that um, tribal member ended up losing her election um, by eight votes. Uh, and there was 12 um, uh, uh, council members that weren't able to vote. Next slide. Uh, additionally, and disturbingly, uh, under this uh, administration, we uh, found the use of the, the ADA being used to close down um, Native American uh, uh, access. So on reservation um, polling sites, because of the abject poverty, often do not uh, meet uh, ADA uh, standards. Um, but they, uh, and so they'll say, um, you know, we can't uh, come have a polling place here. Um, and so they'll move a, po a polling place 100 miles away. <laughs> uh, and that's not an exaggeration, or, or many miles away and say, uh, in order to find a, a compliant building. Now, of course, access is important, but there are ways to accommodate that are lawful. For example, uh, the usage of curbside voting, um, the, that's where a disabled person can um, uh, ring a bell or call a number and have a ballot brought out to them. And those are acceptable under the ADA and obviously should be employed instead of making a disabled person and all of the um, uh, rest of the community members travel very far off the reservation in order to cast their ballot. Next slide. Uh, out of precinct voting also disenfranchises Native American voters. Um, this is because Native Americans often uh, work off of the reservation um, and travel very far distances. In Nevada, we saw uh, people traveling to Reno 90 miles away uh, before they, they uh, every day making that trip. Um, and in uh, Arizona, likewise, we saw um, people making very long commutes. And on the Navajo Nation, um, the precincts uh, don't match up with the traditional lines uh, of the communities. Um, so they have a, what are called chapter houses that are political entities that sort of govern a region. Um, and so and the Navajo people are very used to voting there in their own system, but the precinct line does not align, align with that chapter house system. And so a confused voter uh, may go to their chapter house uh, and um, in Arizona, uh, it, when you cast your ballot um, in and out of precinct, the entire ballot was uh, tossed out instead of uh, going down uh, to the uh, up until the uh, the vote where the precinct matters. Um, so time and time again, we see Native Americans uh, vote at high rates out of precinct. Next slide. And that I should say um, that out of precinct voting was challenged and is um, uh, there's a, a cert petition before the Supreme Court now. Um, so there are um, you know ways that uh, uh, tribes themselves have tried to counter out counteract these barriers to casting a ballot. Um, but these uh, really have to be left up up to the discretion of the tribe. So we saw, for example, um, the Navajo Nation set their election, um, or we've seen that if tribes set their elections the same day as uh, local and county races, or city and state races, that can increase turnout. But in some communities, that would be actually detrimental because um, like I said, that chapter house system, for example, um, has uh, count, uh, communities that are um, uh, outside of the precinct system. So the tribal member would be forced to choose between which one uh, to vote in, uh, and that can lead to confusion. So really, we have to be deferred to tribes um, as to whether or not they want to align their systems with um, other system, with, with the city and state and federal elections. Next slide. Um, and then, you know, there's a, also a large uh, population of urban voters. We didn't talk about them much, um, but what we saw uh, for urban voters um, is that they also suffer disproportionately from homelessness um, and uh, that they uh, consistently saw that voting materials and outreach was not aimed to them. Next slide. Um, and so uh, given the high rates of homelessness, 
uh, Native Americans were, uh, you know, often moving from home to home, just like we saw on a reservation, and therefore did not have that consistent address, and it made them it difficult for them to register and receive a ballot, uh, just like uh, on reservations. Uh, and additionally, um, the Native American voters uh, that are in urban po populations are often culturally isolated, and that is not a mistake. That's a result of um, uh, of removal policies that placed Native Americans in cities and that separated themselves, separated um, Native Americans uh, from aggregating. And so they put them all over a state instead of one place. And so they often find themselves uh, culturally isolated um, and uh, as a result have very little um, uh, community participation. And then now I'll turn it back to Jim. Thanks so much, Jacqueline. So I'm going to talk just very briefly um, in, in a matter of um, probably just about four or five minutes about some of the second generation barriers, which are redistricting barriers. Before I explain the, the map of the state of Washington, I just want to give a few examples. So one of the things that's actually been fairly common that we've actually seen throughout Indian country is um, it's, very, it's been very common to use or to misuse one person, one vote, um, to violate one person, one vote by trying to uh, pack an entire population into a single district. And I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, one, for, one that's a little bit older, one that's more recent. One of the leading cases that, that was cited in the 1975 amendments to the Voting Rights Act was out of Arizona, where in Apache County, roughly about three quarters of the registered voters were, were Native American with the overwhelming majority of those being Navajo and, and some also being Apache and from other tribes. And what the non-Native um, voters wanted to do, those running the county commission, they redrew the lines um, because they, part of what their concern had been, they had been actively trying to prevent Native Americans to register to vote, but with the passage of the 1965 Voting Rights Act, more and more were. And so they responded by um, taking a three-member county commission um, seat, and they packed all, um, the vast majority, roughly about 80 to 85 percent, of all the Native Americans in Apache County into a single district. So you ended up having widely disparate uh, population numbers where you ended up having um, you know, essentially the voting power of non-Natives in Apache County was about 10 to one. Um, and again, that was ultimately litigated in the courts and the federal courts threw it out and Congress relied on that as an example of deliberate efforts to suppress Native voting power. Another example comes more recently from Buffalo County, South Dakota, where that also occurred. And um, in that instance, what happened there was the, the county just simply didn't redistrict for a couple of decades. And not surprisingly, it, it didn't redistrict because it ensured that those who lived on the Crow Creek Reservation uh, did not have their, their ability to um, have an equal opportunity to elect candidates of their choice. And because Native voters comprised over two thirds of the registered voters, um, it prevented them from being able to elect two out of the three county commissioners. So what I'm going to show you now in terms of um, state, um, state legislative seats comes from Washington. So the two big um, kind of darker brown areas that you see are the Colville and Yakima reservations. And one of the things that we received a lot of testimony about in the Portland field hearing was, um, as I'll show you in the next slide, um, it's going to be a little harder to see, but if you look again, um, like around where 15 is, and then you look at up where 12 is, and um, essentially the Colville Reservation and the Yakima Reservation were each split between at least three state legislative districts. I'm just going to flip back just to, so you can see. And the net effect of that is where Native Americans on those reservations would have been able to elect at least um, you know, some members of the state legislature from Yakima and Colville, they were essentially prevented from doing that again through, um, this is what's called cracking. It's the kind of the opposite of packing. Packing is where you kind of put everyone together, a large number of people together, so that their, their votes um, don't really, they, they don't carry much um, voting power because you're, um, where, where you may only need, um, you know, let's say 50% or a little bit higher than that in a district they may pack all of those individuals. So you have a 90% Native district to prevent Native Americans from being able to elect um, a second candidate choice. Here, what they're doing is they're taking very compact areas and they're breaking them up so that Native candidates cannot be elected. And then the last example I'm gonna give, and I'll, I'll, um, I'll this is actually just a, 
in some ways, another example of a one person, one vote violation comes from San Juan County, Utah, which is the area in red. It's in the southeastern portion of Utah. And then within San Juan County, this shows the demographics of the county. And you can see the very kind of dark pink at the very bottom. That's, um, that's where basically most of that's the Navajo Nation. You have some Utes and you have some Zuni and some, uh, some of the other Pueblo tribes are in there. But it's an overwhelmingly majority um, Native American uh, portion of the county. Um, Native Americans comprised um, at the time going into the um, 2010 census roughly about 55 percent of the county's population. And what the county did was the county divided it up uh, for the county commission seats, um, essentially divided up the Navajo Nation into different districts to dilute their powers so that Native Americans were not able to elect any candidates of choice on the three-member county commission. And then for the school board, they just simply didn't redistrict at all. They had a one-person, one-vote violation that they attributed to a Department of Justice consent decree from the 1990 round of redistricting. So they had not redrawn the districts in, in basically two decades. Those were both challenged. Um, they, they, they won in the district court. They were affirmed by the Tenth Circuit. And now, as a result of that, you actually have a majority, two-member majority um, on the three-member county commission as well as majority on the um, school board. This just uh, this is gonna, gonna be a good transition back to Jacqueline. This will highlight one of the things that happened because obviously when you have a um, successful section two case, um, section two is the general non-discrimination provision of the Voting Rights Act. Um, and it's, it's what's commonly used to, to challenge uh, redistricting lines, um, especially where they have a racially uh, discriminatory um, impact. Um, you'll see that, not surprisingly, you have Native Americans who are going to run for office. And here you'll actually see that there were direct racial appeals made to the non-Native voters saying, don't vote for the Navajo uh, candidate because, you know, Willie Gray Eyes is going to take all of your money and spend it on the reservation. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Jacqueline, who's going to tell you a little bit more about Willie Gray Eyes. Yeah, so I think San Juan County has obviously been... Um, uh, talked about kind of a, a few times here. Um, and I think that uh, we should, it should all culminate in what uh, ended up being a, a discrimination uh, case that is really remarkable. Uh, and that was that uh, the actual county official um, ended up alleging that, ended up committing fraud <laughs> in order to invalidate uh, Willie Gray Eye's a candidacy because they were so um, afraid that uh, Native Americans would end up with a majority on uh, the county commission. Um, and so they backdated a complaint against his candidacy. Uh, and then uh, the sheriff was sent out to investigate whether or not uh, he in fact was a resident. Um, and then simply found that because he did not have um, and uh, there weren't any tire tracks in front of his house, then therefore he clearly didn't live there, uh, uh, which is, I think, uh, a, a terrible <laughs> investigation. Um, and uh, the county official removed him from the ballot. Uh, he then had to um, uh, seek fe uh, relief in the court, who obviously found uh, that this was um, an abuse of power and was, you know, that he was wrongly removed from the ballot and ordered him back on the ballot. Uh, eventually, uh, he, he also has been a resident of San Juan County for at least 50 years. His residency really um, isn't at question. It's just that he lived near the Arizona border. Uh, and so, um, you know, the allegation was that he was not a San Juan County resident. Um, he was placed then um, uh, back on the ballot and subsequently won the election. Next slide. Uh, so that is to say that there is hope, uh, you know, that there have been obviously successful candidates. Uh, Indian country has been heartened uh, by the election of Sharice Davids and Deb Holland to Congress. Um, there are many places uh, throughout the country where Native Americans make up sufficient numbers of the population that they should be in control of things like counties and uh, state school boards. Um, there should be increased representation in Congress. Um, there should be, um, uh, based on, on the population, uh, there should be just increased representation acro across uh, Indian country. Next slide. 
Um, and uh, when the unfortunate reality is, is that when these uh, candidates run, they often face overt uh, racism in their case, in their, in their, um, uh, in their, when they're running. Um, and so, for example, we saw um, uh, one person, uh, the same person whose ballots were uh, were never mailed to the tribal council. Uh, when she was running for that office, um, she uh, would get uh, racist voicemails. And when she called uh, voters trying to encourage them to vote for her, uh, she was subjected to racist abuse. Uh, next uh, slide. Um, but again, pivoting to more positive note, um, this is a brief video that we took in North Dakota um, after the uh, voter ID case. These are the Turtle Mountain um, Student Youth Council uh, that marched uh, to get out the vote um, in, in, on their reservation uh, following the decision there allowing uh, expanding access to IDs. Um, and they were a really inspirational community. And, and in fact, that year found, uh, there was record turnout um, on, uh, among uh, the, the Native American communities and uh, Ruth Buffalo ended up being elected to state legislature, um, a, a Native American, one of the first Native American women uh, in the North Dakota state legislature. So thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you so much. I just want to commend you for all the work that y'all have done to put together the report, but also, you know, putting together those field hearings. Um, what a challenge, but um, I'm glad all of the coalition members try to participate and create those next networks with the tribes because it's really important to have this um, issue highlighted you know, what are the impacts for Native people, which really wasn't like extensively reviewed in one place before. And so I just want to commend y'all for that work. Um, I think it's so important. And I think, you know, building on what um, Jacqueline and Jim uh, shared, I just want to talk about, you know, what do we do now with pandemic voting, you know? So we had all of these serious barriers in place that Jim and Jacqueline talked about before the coronavirus. Um, and then the pandemic hits. And so that totally exacerbates things. And so it's important to talk about that. In addition to that, Native Americans have been disproportionately impacted by the coronavirus. And this has, you know, really shown <clears throat> and exposed gross inequities and basic services for native people. Um, the goal for election officials should be to protect uh, the health and safety of the community and of all voters, while also respecting the sovereignty of tribes. I think it's important to note that while providing meaningful opportunities to participate in state and federal elections. So, you know, as Jim and Jacqueline mentioned, like native voters face barriers in every step of the process. They already had unequal access to voter registration, unequal access to in-person early voting, unequal access to even a polling location. And then, you know, vote by mail wasn't really a huge consideration unless they were moving jurisdictions to all vote by mail. And we had San Juan litigation about that because you know, that negatively impacted the Navajo voters in that area. Um, and so, you know, these issues are totally compounded by the coronavirus. So, for example, voter registration is usually done in person. Um, and one of the reasons why is there are a lot of online voter registration opportunities that states provide, but one, most natives, as Jim and Jacqueline mentioned, don't have access to broadband or internet. Two, some states require that you have um, traditional mailing street addresses to include in that voter registration form online. Um, I just like to note that in Arizona, we highlighted that as a huge barrier before the pandemic to conduct voter registration. 
Um, and we press the Secretary of State to try to revise that system, especially with the pandemic, to allow Native voters to register to vote online with a non-traditional address. And that actually happened as of September 4th. So if you have a state ID in Arizona, you can register to vote online. If not, you still need a paper form. And I want to note there was a lot of litigation in these areas before the pandemic. Um, so we know that these challenges are compounded. And then, you know, vote by mail is just not a simple task for Native people in general before the pandemic. But with the pandemic, there have been calls to change elections to vote by mail. And so while some advocates may say, of course, there should still be in-person voting opportunities available, most state laws uh, leave those decisions to the counties and counties make those decisions. And many times counties are not interacting with the tribes or they're not providing tribes an opportunity to say where they would like their polling locations to be or even if they want an early voting location to be. And so we know, um, you know, obviously there's a lack of home mail delivery in Arizona. Only 18% of Native Americans have home mail delivery outside of Pima and Maricopa County. We know that Native voters need language assistance to vote by mail. Um, in some places it isn't oral, but in many of the Native communities it must be oral and you can't really do that by mail. Um, there's a huge concern with regards to closing polling locations um with vote by mail because we know that if you close polling locations and people with insufficient means and access um you know they may not go the extra 20 miles to the next polling location so that will impact whether or not they will be able to participate in that election and that in general lack of in-person polling opportunities decrease turnout in lower socioeconomic communities and the one other issue that Jim mentioned, um, and I think Jacqueline did also, but rejection of ballots is a huge issue. Um, if you fail to do something correctly, the Navajo Nation had filed a lawsuit because um, the state was not allowing curing of unsigned ballots. And those individuals who spoke Navajo actually weren't be being provided the language assistance to even know what the process was to fill out their early ballot application or how to sign it. And so that's the challenge. And we also have the challenge if you don't, if you receive your mail late and you return it late, there's a high likelihood that your ballot's going to be returned late and it's going to be rejected because it wasn't received on time. So I just want to highlight two things that happened. Um, you know, right after the pandemic with regards to, you know, planning for the primaries in New Mexico and Arizona. Um, so basically, Arizona wanted to move to a vote by mail effort, and they attempted to include it in the budget and it and it failed. Um, and so the goal was like most people in Arizona vote by mail, about 80, uh, 70 to 80% are on the permanent early voting list, but there's a large number of native people who just don't vote by mail. So there was a huge concern by the tribes that this will result in closure of polling locations. And then we had a case filed in New Mexico by the counties and they wanted to move to an all vote by mail system. And under their plan, they would have closed 54 of the 61 locations on the Navajo reservation. The Pueblos and the Navajo Nation filed amicus briefs because most of these polling locations would be filed. Um, and one of the issues was they were only going to have vote ballot replacement centers um, in certain areas that were already determined in November of the preceding year. So there was no way to add additional locations, which would definitely uh, negatively impact tribal voters. Um, I just want to highlight when we're thinking about how we minimize the risk to ensure the right to vote that, you know, these counties should be consulting with tribes. Um, and they should be respecting their health orders. So what happened in New Mexico is some of the counties knew that the Navajo Nation went on lockdown early on um, and they had health orders in effect. And so they said, well, we can't have a polling location at your chapter facility because your chapter is closed. And 
that totally was not the case or people can't travel so we can't have early voting on the reservation so the navajo nation clarified that in their health order to say that voting is an essential activity they want people to vote and have been working to coordinate with the counties um, and the chapters to provide those polling locations obviously if there are any changes there has to be sufficient education and again mail is not the answer so how are we going to provide this education to people and another huge issue with the pandemic is that these voter registration opportunities must continue. Um, and how do you do that during the pandemic? And some uh, voter outreach groups and counties have been doing a drive through voter registration or voter registration at uh, food distribution drives. And again, like the, the one of the main things is like to require that there still be in person voting, whether that's early or election day, or really it should be both. Um, in the New Mexico side, the Secretary of State did a good job and she was trying to meet with the counties and tribes and provide some guidance um, to say, if you do adjust your polling locations prior to election day, that you should consult with tribes and get their input um, before you make any of these changes. Um, and so that was guidance that she issued. And in Arizona, the Secretary of State actually had conversations with tribes and the counties that if there was a vote by mail um, bill that was passed in the state of Arizona, that the counties would agree to, hey, um, let me talk to the tribe first before I close anything. Um, so that they would have to communicate with the tribes and that's what they were moving towards if that were to be passed. Thankfully, that didn't turn out to be the case, but um, that was a basically a, not an agreement, but something that was being worked on. I guess the main point is guidance is guidance and sometimes these counties don't follow guidance. Um, and so in New Mexico, McKinley County, um, filed an action and obtained a an order consolidating polling locations on the Navajo Nation in the primary election, which happened in June, without even contacting the Navajo Nation. So I think this kind of goes to the concern that was raised throughout the field hearings that there needs to be more robust consultation and interaction and requirements for the counties um, to engage with the tribes because now they're even though it was guidance, it wasn't a legal obligation. Um, so I want to switch to really um, focus on like early voting and how people can early vote. So in, in this election, we want people to participate in voting and we want people to have an option and there's a huge push for early voting. But one of those things that you can do is actually have more in-person early voting opportunities because closing polling locations or having everyone vote on election day, yes, that will make longer lines. It makes more, you know, it's harder for people to social distance. And in Native communities, they're scared because of the high rates of illness and deaths among Native Americans, and they want to ensure that people are protected. Um, so the Intertribal Council of Arizona, the Rural Utah Arizona Project is creating voter safety kits to provide to voters in advance of the election. So they have a mask and a pen and hand sanitizer, everything that they need to bring in with them in case the PPE isn't there um, and something with regards to their rights. But these are different options and I'll just focus on Arizona. There's in-person early voting. There's vote by mail, there's drop box locations to drop off your ballot because it doesn't really make sense if you live on a reservation to drop your ballot in the mail if it's gonna take seven to 10 days to return to the county. Um, there could be drop boxes and special election boards that can be used to go out and, um, and, uh, and get ballots of people who are homebound disabled uh, individuals. Um, the issue in Arizona is that there was a lawsuit called uh, Vota, Famili Vota Latino dealing with the ballot receipt deadline. And the Secretary of State settled that case to provide more funding for rural and tribal communities. Uh, but the counties just need to ask for the money. And so the counties, not all of the counties have asked 
for funding or providing additional opportunities for native voters to try to reduce the spread. And so I just want to give one example, which is um, um, the, the Pasquayaki tribe. You could have all of these different types of things for in-person voting, whether election day or you know early voting, larger facilities, drive-through voting. The Pasquayaki tribe actually had their own tribal elections and they did drive-through voting and most tribal voters voted that way. Curbside voting, you could rent tents and generators so that it could be outside in larger spaces because some of the tribal buildings are small. Additional early voting locations, actually having mobile voting units that move around. And uh, so as a result of this lawsuit that I was telling you about, there's this $1.5 million that the Secretary of State um, allocated uh, for rural and tribal communities. And so all of that funding is available in Arizona. I know that um, New Mexico also has $6 million additional funding for the elections. And these resources can be requested by the county. And the Pasquayaki tribe does not have any early voting locations for the state and federal election. And they've been requesting this since 2018 when the county closed their early voting location, which results in individuals having to take the bus uh, to travel two hours round trip to participate in early voting. Um, and that's just not just the Board of Supervisors has actually authorized an early voting location there as well as drop off location and the county is just refusing to provide that access to the tribal voters. And on the Thonautham Nation, which is also in Pima County, there's only one polling location and Thonautham is one of, one early voting location, sorry, not polling location, but Thonautham Nation is one of the largest land-based tribes in the United States. So I just wanna mention that. And despite all these issues, um, tribes are doing their best to get out the vote. And so I just wanted to show this because the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian community always has a contest for a design to, to work on their get out the vote after effort. And so they, this year, um, this is the first year they're having an early voting location, drop off locations. They actually have two early voting locations, drop off locations, as well as hosting their traditional polling location. They've been working very hard with the county to provide this access um, and and they put this billboard up along, <laughs> along the roadside so that you can see how important that this is and how they're encouraging people to participate in this election. I just want to say in general there's so many cases involving early voting going on across the United States you can't even follow it like there's just so many things happening. Um, and a lot of these issues impact native voters or will impact native voters even if they're not brought by native people. And I just wanna focus on one issue, um, which is ballot collection and talk about um, the DNC versus Hobbs decision that was issued by the Ninth Circuit and by an en banc panel of the Ninth Circuit in January. So basically Jacqueline already mentioned that Part of this was an out of precinct um, uh, ballot challenge. They were basically discarding the whole ballot if somebody voted out of precinct. And the court found that that had a discriminatory and disparate impact on Native Americans, Hispanics, and African Americans that resulted in a denial and abridgment of the right to vote under section two. But the other part of that case was a ballot collection, which had been tried pre-Shelby and didn't succeed, didn't move forward, but post-Shelby, the state legislature passed a ballot collection ban. And what the court found was that the ban on ballot collection was specifically passed with discriminatory intent to eliminate voting efforts utilized by minority communities, including Native Americans. And that the ballot collection law disenfranchised Native voters and found that it violated section two and the 15th amendment. Um, so that case is currently on cert, a uh, petition for cert was filed by the attorney general. The secretary of state filed um, a pleading saying that the attorney general doesn't have the authority 
to challenge uh, this decision. And it was supposed to be sent to conference on the 29th. So this week they were supposed to be discussing it. And so if CERT is granted, the stay will remain in place, which will be a challenge for native voters who are assisting people um, in this election because of all the things Jim and Jacqueline mentioned. Um, but if CERT is not granted, um, then ballot collection should be allowed. And I just want to turn it over to Jacqueline to talk about the Western Native Vote case and the Mo Montana and Nevada cases. And I can take this off. Oh, well, thanks so much, Patty. Um, so really quickly, um, uh, NARF and the ACLU brought a case in, so in Montana, Western Native Voice uh, v. Stapleton. And there was also um, a uh, uh, five tribes that were NARF clients um, there uh, that uh, challenged the ballot, what was called the Ballot Interference Protection Act. Um, and what this is, is this sort of boogeyman that's getting um, offered up over and over again about ballot harvesting. You know, this idea that ballot harvesting is gonna lead to this widespread um, uh, fraud. But in fact, uh, what ballot harvesting is in Native American communities is ballot collection. And that's just picking up and dropping off each other's mail, right? <laughs> and that's just picking up and dropping off each other's mail because uh, Native Americans uh, lack mail access and have to travel all these distances to get to the post office and all the barriers we mentioned. And we bought that case in state court. And this is what the, what the judge said I think is notable. She says, the questions presented cannot be viewed through the lens of our own upbringings, our own life experiences, but through the lens of the cold, hard data that was presented at trial about the clear limitations Native American communities in Montana's face and how the costs associated with BIPA are simply too high and too burdensome to remain the law of the state of Montana. And there, uh, the, the, the um, ballot collection ban was overturned. Uh, and now um, organizations like Western Native Voice that go around and pick up ballots for uh, Native voters um, so they don't have to make that trip to the post office is again legal. And uh, people that are just uh, doing the neighborly thing of picking up and dropping off each other's mail aren't gonna be you know, charged with felonies. Um, and similarly in Nevada, they had a ballot collection ban that was temporarily placed on hold uh, as a, given the COVID emergency. And there, um, the Trump administration challenged um, that, uh, that, that emergency legislation and the tribes uh, intervened, um, you know, motioned to intervene uh, there because of their interests. They also do not receive at-home mail delivery and pick up and drop off each other's mail for each other um, and, uh, and so need the protection uh, uh, or you know, should not be charged uh, with felonies uh, just for, for, for that. Um, in that case, uh, the case was dismissed um, for a lack of standing. And so the ballot collection uh, ban is not, uh, not going to be in effect and, and people can pick up and drop e off each other's ballots. And, and ballot collection is critical throughout Indian country. Yeah, thank you for that, Jacqueline. I, um, I know that people have been working hard to protect the right to vote. And one of the um, attendees has asked, are there any specific needs that can be met to expand and protect access to the November ballot in Native communities? Do we have a call to action of what we can, you know, ask for or ask how people can help? Well, I would just say uh, push back against attempts um, to move all vote by mail, right? Um, so I think that you know if Native tribes are 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 losing their in-person voting locations, question that. Uh, let your county officials know that you're watching. Let them know that um, you know not providing services on Indian lands is problematic, um, and that in polling, uh, uh, in reservation polling locations are still necessary. But Patty, you're also on the ground. Uh, and fighting. So what, what do you suggest? Yeah, so we are making sure that we have election protection volunteers uh, for the upcoming election to make sure that voters are able to exercise their right to vote. We run a hotline in the state of Arizona for Arizona voters so they can provide them information. Um, so just to share, like most of the polling location tools don't include reservations because reservations have non-traditional addresses. So we're working with some vendors to create a tool to 
locate all of the polling locations, early voting and drop boxes in Indian country and our hotline is answering calls all the time. But if anybody wants to volunteer, they can go to the ASU Indian Legal Clinic website and sign up to be an election protection volunteer. But there will probably also be election protection volunteers in all of the states. Um, so Jim, did you have something to add? Yeah, so I, I think the other thing I'll mention, this is actually where, and and, and, she, and Patty knew I was going to have to do a little bit of overlap with census, but yeah. one of the things that we've done for census, because a lot of the same problems we've seen with um, with voting have been prevalent and have been really, um, really, really evident in terms of what we're seeing with the census, we have, um, to, to overcome some of the broadband issues, we've been able to get satellite Wi-Fi and broadband in some places to get Wi-Fi hotspots. And one of the things that's been really good, we never intended that the census was going to be this close to election day, but so many of the hotspots that we've been at, that we put out that, that, you know, Native American Rights Fund and National Congress of American Indians have put out, we actually have them for like 90 days. So they're going to run over and have overlap with election day. The reason why this is important is because it's going to make it a lot easier for people who are on the ground trying to get out the vote they'll actually have the ability to access social media and to reach people. And far too often that's not the case. And it's been especially true with the pandemic because people may be locked down in their homes where they have absolutely no broadband access at all. And one of the things that we commonly have heard is that uh, people will go to like a local grocery store or a cafe um, or the 7-Eleven, um, you know, just some place that they can actually get um, Wi-Fi coverage and park in the parking lot and use it. And the great thing about this is, and I'll use the Navajo Nation as an example, we have, um, my understanding is we're going to have Wi-Fi hotspots at most of the chapter houses. And there are approximately, I'm going to get it within a couple, but it's about 110 roughly that cover three different states. And that's going to make it so much easier to get out the vote. And again, because of what um, we've all kind of talked about, the reason why, um, you know, we're not, we're certainly not opposed to vote by mail, but it's got to be vote by mail plus. And the plus is an opportunity to vote in person. And that's so important. There are not just linguistic reasons, but cultural reasons why Native Americans feel much more comfortable voting. And I'm going to throw another stat out there. Um, and, and, and this actually is backed up with what you've heard in the news about what's happened in Pennsylvania, where they've talked about the, um, I think they're calling it like a skeleton ballot where it doesn't include the interior envelope and only the exterior envelope, and that those ballots are going to be tossed in Pennsylvania. There is a uh, political scientist at MIT by the name of Charles Stewart who's done an estimate that nationwide where vote by mail has been used, 12 to 20 percent of all ballots are thrown out, and it's thrown out for a variety of reasons. They're received late. They're lost in the mail, so they're never received to begin with. Uh, they don't have a signature match. They're lacking an interior um, a ballot um, or interior envelope. So this just, this just um, emphasizes the importance of having people on the ground making sure that people understand how they need to complete their ballot. They're going to vote by mail. They absolutely should feel free to do that, but to make sure that they're filling it out correctly so the ballot isn't, um, doesn't end up in a waste bin someplace. Yeah, I think those are really good um, points and things to point out with regards to the similarities in the census. And obviously, if Native people aren't participating in the census um, because the census hasn't, you know, really done what should be done at this point, um, that will impact redistricting. So this like not only impacts funding, but could impact those lines and, and uh, the redistricting process. So that's really important. Um, I think we're about out of time, but somebody asked about the billboard and I failed to mention that the billboard um, is at the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian Community and the person who does their GOTV is Angela Williford and they work really closely with their youth council to try to energize and get out the vote. So another thing that we're encouraging people to do is to serve as poll workers. Um, especially because a lot of the poll workers who usually serve are at the, in the at-risk category. Um, so trying to get younger people to serve as poll workers is um, very important. I want to thank everyone for joining us for this free webinar. And I also want to thank uh, my colleagues, Jim Tucker and Jacqueline DeLeon for
their presentations and for sharing with us. They're really doing a tremendous work in Indian country. Um, and so we appreciate that. Um, your work is so critical and we thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to share your experiences with us. I wanna note that the civil section of civil rights and social justice provides free webinars and resources for legal professionals and advocates nationwide. We hope this helps you in your work. And if you can, please consider joining and becoming active in the ABA. You may do so at ambar.org forward slash CRSJ. You can find information on other free programs on the Civil Rights and Social Justice webpage. Best of luck in your work and stay safe, everybody. And please register to vote and make sure you register someone else to vote and um, go out and vote on election day. Take care.